Hey, what's up guys? In an attempt to make my reef systems here just a little bit easier to manage, I've decided to go with more of a natural setup. Now, originally, I had this idea that I was going to make everything surgically clean, bare bottoms, uh, very species specific, and kind of going with that, and just basically keeping the tanks as pristine as possible. And the problem with that is that if something were to take hold, whether it be like a certain type of algae or a certain type of pest, it really flourishes because you've created this, this laboratory clean space, not just for your corals, but for potential nuisance as well. Okay, so with that in mind, I wanted to go over five different critters that kind of help along this process. The first one are copper band butterflies. Now, this fish doesn't necessarily make sense to everyone because the biggest problem with them is that they have a very restricted diet. They really only eat things like worms and aptasia, which is kind of like why I have them. It's, it's mainly for aptasia control. They, they do an, an amazing job of keeping those pest anemones down. The problem, of course, is that if they're not taking to a secondary food source, they can starve. And luckily, all of ours eat mysis shrimp, but you kind of have to make sure that they're getting all their nutritional needs. But as, as, if you're able to do that, I think they're just an amazing fish. They're pretty, they're very sociable, they're non-aggressive to, to other fish, and uh, they have a ton of personality. Like they're always in your face and you can practically feed, you know, not practically, you can feed them by hand. The second fish that I'll talk about is a fox face. Now, I consider them like the apex predator of macroalgae. If you don't already know, uh, macroalgae, which is very nice in its own sense, it's decorative, it's good for nutrient removal, also comes with the problem that it can also compete with coral. And if it grows right next to coral, it can actually uh, inhibit the growth of the coral. So you can try to scrape that off with you know by hand, but if you're working with large systems, it's not particularly practical to do so. So in that sense, you kind of do need to have good herbivores in place. And I consider fox faces to be tip top of that list. So you might be wondering why not tanks? Um, tanks can absolutely do a very similar job to a fox face. And in one sense, it's better because a fox face, they have a venomous spine, whereas uh, tangs typically, you know, they're not, they're not venomous. But the problem with tangs is that they are monumental jerks. And I've run into certain situations where a tang will get really well established into a tank and pretty much end any and all possibility for me to add additional fish. And in one particular system, I have a 300 gallon big Rubbermaid tub. And in this tub is literally two fish, a tang and a clownfish. And between those two, they're able to pretty much kill any new addition. In a, in, a, in a tank that size even. So I don't run into that similar problem with fox faces, so that's kind of like my, my personal preference. But both of them do the, the job admirably. Okay, third on the list are snails. We primarily use Asterina snails throughout the greenhouse, and they do a very good job. Uh, they're voracious consumers of microalgae and film algae and stuff like that. They're, and the thing I like about snails is that they eat right up to the edge of the coral. And so you end up with like these, you know, clean looking uh, coral plugs. And, you know, otherwise, uh, like fish can't necessarily get right up to that edge. And if you were trying to do it by hand, you might damage the coral. But snails can do that really effectively. And um, if you get a good batch of them, they completely eliminate all, all that nuisance film algae throughout the entire tank. Having said that, the problem with the Asterina snails, I don't even know how they survive in the wild sometimes because they flip over all the time and when they flip over, they just can't right themselves. And if you've ever seen one get like knocked off the glass and fall down, invariably, it's like a cat, you know how the cats always land on their feet? These things always land on their back. And like, how is this an animal that has survived millions of years? I have no idea. but. 
Um, yeah, so when, when I go through the tanks, I always kind of like flip all the ones that have, uh, that have fallen. Um, but yeah, that, that can be a little bit annoying. Now, another more expensive option for snails, um, this would probably be my preference if the snails didn't cost 10 times as much, are trochus snails. They have a slightly more dark appearance. Uh, they're, I think they're called a turban snail because their shell has like this uh, striped pattern on it and actually kind of looks like the shape of a turban, I guess. Those snails are able to flip themselves over. And as a bonus, they, they breed in a home aquarium. So if you start off with some and they start breeding, you'll actually get you know, a recurring supply of them. Um, it's not terribly common for them to breed, but it's happened in our systems before. Like randomly we'll see little baby snails pop up and that's like the best thing that ha that's happened to me all day. Because those snails are uh, about, I think they're like two to three dollars a piece. Whereas, I mean, trochuses are, 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 I'm sorry, Asterina snails are much less. So, yeah, if I had a choice, I would probably go with the trochus. But for if you need sheer volume, like if you need, for example, in my case, a thousand snails every few months, um, Asterinas are probably the, the only really good bang for the buck algae control. All right, number four, grasses. Now, a little while ago, this saltwater tank um, posted a video about how she had some some nuisance uh, nudibranchs that were eating her montipora, and you know, on online there's all these um, anecdotal tales of, of of a certain ras that can control this problem because dipping um, dipping montipora for nudibranchs is a largely ineffective process to control it. Like the nudibranchs are so resistant. Their eggs are so resistant that you could dip it 50 times and you'll probably still end up with um, more, more nudibranchs and a dead coral. So um, online people are talking about uh, different types of wrasses. Her take was, I don't know which wrasse actually will do the job. So I'm going to get eight different kinds of wrasses and, and see how they do. And I think that in her case it worked out. So. Um, I would probably do something similar now. I haven't gone out and gotten all the different types of wrasses and thrown them, them all into my systems. But the one that seems to, to come up the most in terms of controlling pretty much everything across the board, whether it be bristleworms, um, anything associated with like flatworms, or even these nudibranchs, it's the Melanaris wrasse. So we've pretty much put a Melanaris wrasse into every single system. And we have six lines as well. But I think that if that doesn't handle our issue, we're probably going to go with like the, the mass grass collection and see, and see how that does. Lastly, number five. And this one might not be for everyone. It might not actually be for me either. Uh, these guys have a bad reputation, but it's uh, damsels. They've done a really good job in my tank of eliminating pests, almost to the extent that what you would expect to see from a RAS that we had just talked about. Uh, the type that we get are Springer's damsels, um, Springer eye, and they've done a really good job of handling things like flatworms. Um, you can actually see them pick them off of the glass, so clearly they're doing something, and they tend to be less aggressive. That's kind of the big knock on on uh, damsels in general is that they can kind of get really really feisty especially once they get larger they tend to get uglier and more aggressive so it's like the worst of all worlds um, they're super tough you're not really going to be losing damsels left and right they're not a fragile fish but it's that feistiness that people generally stay, stay away from and for the longest time um, our springers damsels they were fine like they didn't they didn't bother any other fish and actually, to be perfectly honest, they still don't bother other fish. The problem is they bite me. Anytime I stick my hand into the tank, they have a problem. And getting, you know, you know, trying to do some detail work and all of a sudden getting popped is not fun. So that, I guess that's the, the big downside for me. But I think that the, the pros outweigh the cons. So they made my list at number five, but they did make my list. Alright guys, that was a quick update of kind of like where my systems are and kind of the direction that they're heading more towards a natural system rather than uh, like a surgically clean laboratory. Uh, but 
we shall see and I will keep you guys posted. So we're in the process of putting in some substrate and whatnot. In any case, please uh, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you are a subscriber, uh, please also take a look at this little bell icon right by the subscribed button. Uh, for whatever reason, um, YouTube is going and uh, like removing subscribers so people aren't getting the, the notifications and whatnot. So if you like the channel and you still want to get notifications, uh, hit the bell. Thanks. Take care, you guys.